Chapter 2, I Have My Say. The next thing I remember is wa waking up in my bed. A tall gentleman in dark clothes was bending over my head, peering into my face. How are you feeling? He said. I told him my head hurt. I touched the spot where the cut was and felt a bandage. Oh, that will get better, he said, giving me a big smile. I should know. I'm a doctor. Can you tell me what happened? She fell down, Bessie said. She was in the room, standing by the door. I was knocked down, I said, but it wasn't what made me sick. I was locked in the red room where there's a ghost. I told the man everything that had happened, just how it had happened. How would you like to go to school? He asked. I did not know which, what school would be like, but I said, yes, I would. Any place would be better than here, I thought. The man stared at me thoughtfully, then turned to Bessie. I'd like to talk to your mistress, he said. Bessie walked him out, then came back with Abbott. She brought me some cake on a fancy plate, like those she used to serve food for Mrs. Reed and her children. Now you eat this and try to go back to sleep, she said. How happy I would have been to eat off this beautiful plate if I were not sick, if I did not feel so sad. All I wanted to do was cry. I closed my eyes. They must have thought I had fallen asleep, for I heard Abbott say, Poor child, I wish I could feel pity for her, but she's so ugly. It's like trying to feel pity for a sick toad. I know, Bessie said. If it were Miss Eliza or Miss Georgiana who were lying in bed with their eyes closed, they'd look like sleeping angels. Oh, I dote on Miss Eliza and Miss Georgiana, Abbott said. Bessie touched my forehead softly with her hand. Poor Miss Jane, she said. I do care for her, but she's too stubborn for her own good. They left. After a while, I fell asleep. It took just a few days for my body to heal, but the damage to my soul, dear reader, that, to this day, I still feel. Three months passed and not a word was said about me, my being sent to school. Instead, Mrs. Reed had me banished to my room. I took all my meals there alone. Her children were not allowed to speak to me anymore. Then, one day, Bessie burst in. I had just finished eating breakfast, milk and a crusty roll. Miss Jane, take off your pinafore and put on a dress, she said. Someone is here to see you. I couldn't imagine who that could be. Other than the people who lived in this house, I did not know a soul in the world. I went down to the drawing room, not knowing what to expect. A man was standing by the fireplace. He was wearing a long black coat. All I could see at first was his back. He was standing straight and still, and his posture was so stiff, his body so tall and thin, I thought I was looking at a black pillar. Mrs. Reed was sitting on the sofa. When she saw me, she made an impatient motion with her hand, signaling for me to come close. This is the little girl I wrote to you about, she said to the stranger. The stranger turned around to face me. He stared at me hard in silence for a moment, then said to Mrs. Reed, She's so small. What is her age? She's ten years old, Mrs. Reed said. What is your name? the stranger said to me. Jane Eyre, sir. Well, Jane Eyre, he said, are you a good child? She's a bad child, Mr. Brocklehurst, Mrs. Reed said, before I could answer. I'm sorry to hear it, Mr. Brocklehurst said. He bent over so that his face came down to the same level as mine and looked into my eyes. He had a huge nose, gray bushy eyebrows over small round eyes, and a wide mouth with crooked yellow teeth. You know what happens to bad little girls when they die, he asked. They fall into a pit and burn for all eternity, for nothing can extinguish the flames. What must you do to avoid such a fate? Answer me. I must try to stay healthy so I don't die, I said. God decides who stays healthy, he said. You have to pray day and night. You have to pray to God for forgiveness and repent your evil ways. He shook his finger at me and kept staring solemnly at my face. Mr. Brocklehurst, Mrs. Reed said, as I wrote in my letter to you, and as you yourself now see, she's stubborn and impertinent, but the worst of it is, she's deceitful. Oh, it was Mrs. Reed who was deceitful. This very moment she was telling a lie. I never lied, but now Mr. Brocklehurst was going to believe her and think me a liar. I glanced at his face and saw I was right. He looked at me with disgust. Deceit is a terrible fault in a child, he said to Mrs. Reed. 
Stay assured, I'll forewarn her teachers so they keep a close eye on her. I want to understand that she will spend her vacations at school, Mrs. Reed said. I leave her entirely in your care. I will send for her as soon as possible, Mr. Brocklehurst said. The sooner the better, Mrs. Reed said. I've had all I can stand of her. Mr. Brocklehurst bent by the waist and said goodbye. Mrs. Reed and I were left alone. Go back to your room, she said without looking at me. I started walking towards the door, but suddenly I stopped and turned around. I was beside myself with rage. I'm not a liar, I screamed at her. If I were, I would say to you I love you. But I don't love you. I hate you more than anyone in the world. It is you and your children who tell lies. Not a muscle moved on Mrs. Reed's face. She did not even blink. Anything more you have to say, she said. Yes. I'm glad you're not related to me by blood. I'd feel ashamed if you were a blood relative of mine. If anyone asks me how I like you and how you treated me, I'll say the very thought of you makes me sick and that you were cruel and mean to me. How dare you speak to me like that, Jane Eyre? How dare I? Because it's the truth. Anyone who asks me questions about you, I'll just tell them how you treated me. And I'll tell them how you had me locked up in the Red Room and did not care that I could die from fright. I won't lie. I walked out of the room with my head up, taking slow, sure steps. I had never felt so good in my life. I had stood up for myself, and I was proud and glad I'd done it.